as I'm scrambling, someone comes from behind and sacks me, and the ball comes out, and I fumble. <laughs> and right when I fumble, I look up, and, like, I immediately make eye contact with Coach Saban. I can see him from the sideline. And I walk straight to him, and he lets me have it on the sideline. And from that point forward, I was like, all right, I probably should have listened to him the first time. <laughs> <laughs> It's always great to hear from an all-time great Alabama quarterback on what it was like to play for Coach Saban and what Coach Saban means to him. Welcome to Always College Football. I'm Greg McElroy. Today is January 11th. We are about 24 hours removed from the bombshell story that has hit the sport as hard as just about anything. Nick Saban officially retiring from the Alabama Crimson Tide. We will have Heisman Trophy winner Bryce Young on the show to help talk about what the relationship with Coach Saban was like, what maybe was his favorite game, his favorite interaction, a story or two. I have a few stories, a few that I've had saved up, but felt like today was an appropriate day to unleash those on the world. We have so many things that we can hit, and we'll also have plenty of tributes from former players as well. But before we get you out of here, we said we're going to have the 24-hour rule yesterday. We weren't going to talk about future replacements, candidates that are going to be jumping out to the forefront, possibly taking the job. But what I'll tell you today is the qualities that I think Greg Byrne, the athletic director, I'll tell you what he's probably looking for when trying to figure out who is going to be the next head coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide. Let's kick things off with a great conversation with Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, Bryce Young. We welcome in Alabama's fourth Heisman Trophy winner, but the first at quarterback under Nick Saban, Bryce Young. First overall pick of the Carolina Panthers, just finished up his rookie year. Bryce, how you doing, man? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Uh, I'm great, buddy. I can't tell you how much it means that you would be able to carve out a little time for us. Uh, I know that this has been kind of a whirlwind for all of us that played for Coach and and talked to Coach and, and have spent time with Coach. But when you first found out that Coach was shutting it down and, and retiring, what was your reaction? Yeah, I was just, just happy for him. Um, you know, obviously, you know, as we both know, he's done so much. Um, he's changed so many lives. He's helped so many people. Um, you know, he, he's he's done, done so much for university, the city, the state, and um, – you know, I'm happy that, you know, now he kind of gets to gets to sit back and, and enjoy it um, and close that chapter of his life and move on to his next. So, um, yeah, I'm, I was super happy for him. When he was recruiting you, and, and really it was, I mean, 2020, so a little, little different, right? I mean, I guess it was 2019 and 2018 when you were really getting recruited, but you got on campus in 20. When he was recruiting you and people continued to say, oh, well, he, this could be it, how many people actually used the – hey, Coach Saban's going to retire thing against you to kind of maybe mess with your decision-making process. Yeah, it was definitely used a lot of recruiting. Um, you know, <laughs> everyone was always always trying to um, always trying to uh, predict when he was going to retire. Um, but, you know, he always, you know, during, obviously he was there throughout my, my whole time, he told me that he would, you know, that he didn't have any of those plans for, you know, when I was there. And um, also just, it kind of speaks to to Coach Saban, just the infrastructure he he built where, um, you know, it's obviously, you know, Coach Saban was head of it all, um, but he built such a strong infrastructure and a strong rest of the program. Um, You know, everything else was was great as well. Um, So it wasn't really obviously anything that deterred me. When you found out yesterday, did you talk with teammates? Did you talk with uh, players that are currently on the team who I know you still have a lot of relationships with. I mean, what was the conversation like amongst the guys that might have been still on the team and, and the guys that you played with that have since gone on to the NFL? Yeah, um, I think we were all we were all surprised. We were all, um, you know, we were all, uh, we were all kind of taken back and surprised um, about what happened. Um, but again, I think we kind of all had that same, we, we all shared that same kind of kind of sentiment of just, just being happy for him um, and, you know, someone with like like Coach Saban, you don't even, you know, you it, it's so crazy to even think about him not not being coach, him not not you know screaming during fourth quarter at us, him not being out there <laughs> during spring game. Like it, it would be, obviously it's going to take a lot of adjusting. Um, so you know, initially we were all just kind of like, um, you know, we we're all kind of just taken back by that. But you know, ultimately we 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 were all happy for him. 
I know you probably have a million stories. You play quarterback for them. You're gonna get you're gonna get some good and you're gonna get some bad. You had a lot of good, um, but is there a story that kind of stands out to you that helps us understand the relationship that you guys had together? Yeah, um, a fun story from my from my freshman year. Um, you know, we were, it was a Thursday, um, a Thursday early on. I don't even know if the season had uh, started, so it was you know finished with a two minute drill um, and. Uh, it, yeah, it might have been before the season, and we go down, um, you know, two minute drill to end practice. Um, we go down, get down to like the maybe like the twenty five thirty, um, and you know I'm with the two, so it's like the very last thing we do, and there's like six seconds left, so it was the last play of the drill. Um, I drop back, I like scramble, uh, like I roll left, roll right, like make a couple people miss, and then. Um, like throw the ball off my back foot and then put it up for a receiver. It makes a great catch. Um, and we win the, like we win the two minute drill at the end. Like we were all going down and, and celebrating, like receiver throws the ball up. We're all running and like, and jump into like, just to finish practice. And after like a minute of us settling down, I turn around and coach Saban's there just staring like dead <laughs> through me. And he's like, and he, all he does is like, how many times have I told you about the ball? Like I was running around with the ball in like one hand. It's like how many times have I told you about running around with the ball? You got to tuck the ball, keep two as a ball. Um, and I'm like, I'm like, coach, like, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a freshman. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy you won the drill. I'm all happy. I'm like, and then I just miss it. I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah, like you got it. My bad, my bad. And then fast forward, like game one, we play Missouri, and um, like. It might have been like the first or second drive. I get in at the very end, and um, like I scramble, roll right, and as I'm moving, like as I'm scrambling, someone comes from behind and sacks me, and the ball comes out, and I fumble. <laughs> and right when I fumble, <laughs> I look up and like I immediately make eye contact with Coach Saban. I can see him from the sideline, and I walk straight to him, and he lets me have it on the sideline. And from that point forward, I was like. All right, I probably should have listened to him the first time. <laughs> and the rest of like my college career, I always made sure that I had two hands on the ball. Hey, he's never going to waste an opportunity to coach, that's for sure. Um it's yeah. that's amazing. And and of course it first game, of course it happens in the first game. Like why why wouldn't it, right? Unbelievable. Yeah. Um I, I know you had some great moments, some some incredible games, Heisman moment against Georgia in 21, but is there a game that that maybe stands out to you as as one where you felt like he brought maybe some extra juice or or maybe you guys just had a little more interaction there on the sideline or the days leading up? Um, you know, honestly, I feel like one of the one of like the bigger locker room moments that stands out is uh my my last year against um or not last year, excuse me, my uh, sophomore year against Auburn, um right before that that Georgia game. Um, and, you know, Auburn coming in, they didn't have the best record. Um, but, you know, we were – and I think we had already clinched going to the SEC championship. Um, and, you know, we were trying to play, obviously, to try to get into the playoffs. Um, but, you know, we were going to Auburn. And, you know, anytime we go to Auburn, it's always – it's always – something always happens. Um, <laughs> but at halftime, it was either zero – to it was like we hadn't scored at halftime. And it was like maybe like 7-0, 3-0, something like that. Um and we all, you know, we all just wanted to be kind of like a, you know, we all obviously wanted to, wanted, we were expected to go in from the outside and, you know, we were ranked, whatever. And we all went to the sideline, we're like, or we went in halftime, we were all kind of like, all right, like, coach is going to get after us. Like, this is going to be tough in the, in the <laughs> locker room. And one of the things that stood out was that whole, like, his whole locker room speech was, like, the most, one of the most encouraging and, like, positive speeches he gave all year. And, like, it was it was firm and there was like obviously call to action stuff but it wasn't just him being mad it wasn't just him being upset it was like in the moment where like our season was on the line if we didn't you know if we lose that we're now we have two losses we can't get in the playoffs and like in that moment and we're you know underperforming he was like that was probably the most encouraging that was the most that he you know that he pushed us to be better and like was the most calm about it and like I think we all kind of looked in and we're like okay like now we we really can just listen to what he's saying, and we took the stuff that he, he said in the second half, and we carried it throughout, and then obviously led us to the fourth quarter in those overtime games, and like throughout that whole process, there was no just anger, no like obviously he's passionate, but he pushed us and and actually was 
was like the most encouraging in that moment. I think that for me, that's one of those moments that really stood out on just how good of a coach he is, knowing what every moment calls for. It's amazing to me. You're so right when you say that. Just when you think you're going to get ripped, you, you, you do for a moment, uh, like after the fumble yeah. against Missouri. Like, yeah, okay, for a moment, but usually when you're at your lowest, he'll bring you up. And when you're at your highest, he'll bring you back down. And, exactly. and the consistency that he tries to create is ridiculous. And I, I can remember that v- vividly as a player and now having watched it for 15 years and, and 10 years as a broadcaster, you could not be more, more accurate in that assessment. Uh, what would you say you will take from having – listen to him, learn from him. And obviously we know how you're going to apply it to your, to your NFL career, but, but how would you apply it to your life even beyond the field? Yeah, I think probably the, the two biggest things that um, I always talk about that I, I take from him in all aspects of my life is his consistency and accountability. Like how consistent he is, obviously you know he's the same, he's the same person every single day as far as demanding the best out of, out of himself, out of us, same person of, um, you know, when he walks into the building, um, how hard he works. Um, obviously, there's no change from week to week in how he coaches us, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's the Iron Bowl or it's whoever we're playing and, and or whether it's, you know, it's an FCS team. He's the same, that same consistency. And you can expect, you know, he's not going to let anything slide, whether it's summer or it's the day before, you know, the national championship. Like that consistency is something that in all aspects of life, I definitely, you know, I've definitely learned from. And then accountability, like he's, the, the one thing I've always respected about him is obviously, you know, we all know he'll, he'll get after us and, you know, the, that's kind of the side the media sees. And, but he's that way with the coaches. He's that way with yeah. the rest of the staff. He's that way with himself, first and foremost. He'll always start with, you know, in the times that he'll always be the first to be like, I didn't do this and I should have done this when he's talking about things. And he'll always take accountability for himself. And, um, you know, it's all, whenever he gets after someone, it's all warranted. It's all, you know, you know that there's no games behind it. There's no politics. Like, if he got after you, like, you, you deserved it. Like, and because he'll do that for, he'll get after anyone. And just that that, that level of accountability, um, you know, those things are, are definitely that stuff that, um, you know, that I, I take into all aspects. Yeah, that's definitely appropriate. No one is immune. Uh, it does not matter. And I always feel like the players, we didn't get it that bad. The coordinators, now they got it. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. the, the equipment staff on occasion, yeah, they got it pretty good too. But yeah. it, it's par for the course. Finally, we'll get you out of here with this. Uh, you obviously have a relationship with guys on the team right now. What advice would you give to the guys that are kind of sitting there in limbo? Because that's got to be a difficult spot to be in. Yeah, for sure. Um, just to, to trust the process and know that, you know, obviously Coach Saban has been there for so long and it's going to be weird and it's to be different without him there. But through all that, he's built a culture and built a machine that, you know, obviously is capable of, of, of continuing and running past that. And, um, you know, whoever they, else they, they bring in is obviously going to understand that and do everything to, you know, they're going to keep that going. Um, but it's that, you know, Coach Saban said it all the time. If he has to be the disciplinarian, he has to be the one who's yelling at us, and he has to be the one reminding us of what we're doing, what the standard is, it's not going to be a good team. And ultimately, he does all that just to show, you know, the leaders and the guys that are there to enforce it what the standard is. And it's always, he's always believed in a player-led team. He's always believed in it being about the people there, and that's something that that doesn't have to change. Um, So just to, to trust in and believe in that. Yeah, well, Bryce, I can't tell you how much we appreciate the time. Know you're busy. Uh, congrats on all your success. We love you. We appreciate you. And we miss you in college football, but we're, we're excited to see your continued growth in the NFL, my friend. Thanks again for the time. Thank you. I appreciate you. Have you ever dreamed of hitting the road in your very own customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter? Follow college football all season long by hitting all the biggest games in college football's most celebrated stadiums. At ESPN, we dreamed that dream, and with the help of Mercedes-Benz, we made it happen. This year, our very own Jen Latta has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz designers to create a road-ready, fully functional, state-of-the-art podcast studio on wheels. The ride is pure Mercedes-Benz, with all-wheel drive and the latest driver assistance, safety, and tech. The podcast studio must be seen and heard to be believed. A spacious and chill conversation space with mics, camera, and mixing board to capture the action. On board, Jen Latta 
We'll be interviewing some of the biggest names in college football. All points to Mercedes-Benz for always bringing some extra. Out back of the Sprinter, they're innovating, pushing the science of the tailgate, complete with grill, cooler, TV monitors, and more. This is hashtag van life meets the fan life. To get an inside look to this one-of-a-kind, blow-your-mind collaboration came together, visit mbvans.com slash Sprinter Labs. The Mercedes-Benz ESPN College Football Podcast Sprinter coming soon to a game near you. Over the last 24 hours, we've really heard from so many different people that have a personal anecdote about an interaction with Coach Saban. I have a million a million, several of which I've shared on multiple platforms. Uh, you can probably catch those in a bunch of different places, but we saved the best here for always college football. I have a few that I want to tell that I haven't told before. Okay, so these are pretty, they're, they're funny uh, in some ways. Um, they're telling in some ways, but they also at the same time kind of give you a glimpse of what Coach Saban was like. Uh, away from the facility in some cases and what he was like on game day. But we'll start with the first meeting. And he was announced on January of whatever of 2007. And our first meeting was probably three or four days later. Now, he met with a few players in small groups individually earlier on. And it's it's kind of amazing uh, how he laid out his plan. He said, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be a brutal offseason program. Get prepared. It's going to be awful. But guess what? It's going to be, it's, it'll all be worth it. We're going to find out who wants to, all these things. And we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And it was like clockwork, man. I mean, he called his shot from the time he arrived. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to attack it. This is what practice is going to look like. This is what games are going to look like. And this is what our offseason is going to look like. And he completely laid it out. And in the first team meeting, when he walked in, and be honest with you, the group and the regime before, those team meetings weren't all about focus. <laughs> they were... You know, uh, guys yelling at stuff, you know, yelling at each other. I mean, it was not really law and order. When he walked into the first team meeting, it was as if you could hear a pin drop. The level of intimidation, the level of anxiety among every single player in that room, whether it's senior, freshman, didn't matter. Everyone was a nervous wreck the second he walked in there for the very first time. And when he laid everything out, it made more sense. And he became more approachable as the years went along. But those first couple weeks. Uh, yeah, to say we were on pins and needles, that's putting it mildly. Uh, another great memory that I have of Coach Saban that kind of brings to light just how funny he is and, and how much he's always kind of trying to crack jokes and, and things like that. This was in 2007. And at that point, we were going through the first rendition of the fourth quarter program. And the, t the time, it's 2007, our workout shorts were, were big and they were long and they were heavy. And the first fourth quarter program was so grueling that we were all completely drenched in sweat. I mean, it, is, it was as if we went in our full workout attire, jumped in the pool, got right back out, and that's how wet our clothes were at the conclusion of one of these fourth quarter workouts. And he calls over the head strength and conditioning coach, Scott Cochran, who was right there. He calls over the head equipment manager. It says Tank Connerly, that's who the equipment manager was. Said, we got to get these guys some shorts that fit because I don't like right now when I see guys running their sprints and they're running around and their pants are down. And he literally pulls his pants down and imitates us running. Now, little did Coach know it was not for style. It was not to be cool. It was because our pants were so heavy from the sweat that we had dripped into the shorts that they were falling down as we were running our sprints and our curves and our plyometrics. So he quite literally mooned us as he imitated us going through the workout. So <laughs> that was a way that we all got a good laugh. By the way, there was not much laughing in the fourth quarter program. But when Coach Saban basically mooned us and imitated us running our sprints, that was a lighthearted moment <laughs> in what was six weeks, six weeks of fourth quarter activities there in 2007 that just basically ran us into the ground. A few years later in 2009, I was about to become the starting quarterback. And every year, Coach Saban would take 
all the leaders at, at their specific positions. And he would take the leaders and he would, he would take them out on a boat, on a boat trip. We'd go to coach Saban's house. We'd have lunch. We'd talk about the season. This was usually in late July, right before we're getting ready to go to camp. So we had finished our summer workouts. It was kind of a nice way of just closing everything up and just setting the table for the camp that was coming up and then the season that would ensue. But on this particular year, my first time there, I was like, this is cool. I'm starter now. This is awesome. This is going to be great. And Dante's like, you're going to have a great time. Dante Hightower, you're going to have a great time. It's just so fun. You're going to love this. We'll go out on the boat. We'll go tubing. So Coach Saban, he puts the tube on the back of the boat and, and we start going around and, and Dante's up first and, and he's getting thrown all over the place outside the wake. I mean, going like hopping over the wake with some ridiculous velocity. I mean, coach has to be doing 40, 50, 60 miles an hour on a tube. So we were cruising. Dante is getting thrown around. Rolando McLean's getting thrown around. All these other guys on the team are having these incredible boat rides and this amazing, amazing tubing experience. And I'm up. I'm sitting there thinking, this is going to be great, but I better hold on for dear life, man. This could be intense. Like, I'm not as strong as Dante. I'm not as strong as Rolando, but I'm going to hold on. I just don't want to get thrown too early, right? I mean, you don't want to get thrown off the bull three seconds into your eight-second ride. Like, you just want to kind of hang on and, and, and hang on for dear life. Well, I get on the back of the boat, and Coach Saban's going about 25. I mean, I'm not kidding. Like, I'm standing there. I'm like, all right, when's it coming? Is he going to just veer really quickly, or am I going to be staying in the wake? And basically went around and around and around and, and he never ramped it up. I don't think I ever got outside the wake and I, I got back on. I'm like, coach, what <laughs> you're throwing these guys around. They're having a great time. I'm sitting here like, I mean, goodness gracious. I have, I feel like I have two or three seatbelts on as I'm riding in the back of a minivan. Like, what, what are we doing here? He goes, do you realize right now that if something were to happen to you, we got to go with the freshman. We have to keep you safe and you better understand the importance of protections and that availability is the most important ability. And that if you got hurt out here on the lake, that would be doing a significant detriment to our team. I was like, what <laughs> coach, all I wanted was a good ride. I was just messing with you, man. Like it was all good, but it was him, man. It was him. And then I think one of my favorite stories that really sums up how he's, uh, how he's wired, how he operates. We're playing against Texas in the national championship. Colt McCoy gets hurt early in the game. We're up 24-3 at halftime. We have a convincing lead. We have a comfortable lead. We're in a really good position to, to feel good about where we're at. Um, and I'm not saying that they're in the locker room at halftime. We exhaled or, or we kind of let our guard down. But, you know, a lot of us were like, all right, whew, thank goodness. Like, we're in, we're in good shape, boys. Let's just get this thing to the finish line. And we'll be good. Let's just not lose it, right? So we go into the second half. And Garrett Gilbert, the guy that came in in relief for Colt McCoy, uh, hits a couple of big plays downfield. Next thing you know, I mean, shoot, it's a game. And it's 24 to 21 there in the fourth quarter. We know we got to put a drive together. We ultimately get a couple first downs, pin them deep in the road end, sack fumble. We run it in, another interception. We run it again. I think final score was 37-21. I don't think, I know. The final score was 37-21. We're all so happy. We're celebratory on the sideline. Coach gets doused in Gatorade and I mean, gets hit hard with the Gatorade, I might add. Definitely the worst Gatorade pour of all time, but certainly uh, a good one because it was red and it was all over his white shirt, so it was fitting. Um, gets doused in Gatorade. We go back in the locker room. Everyone's high-fiving like, good job, boys. We did it, man. Let's go. This is awesome. Coach calls us up and, and he, he, we center around. We're all on a knee. And coach is sitting there saying, guys, I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Uh, this, this was a journey. You guys trusted us when we got here. And, and we are very, very grateful to all you seniors. Man, this, this has been a great ride. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for, for everything that you contributed to the program. The program's in a much better place than when you arrived because of your contributions. But for you guys coming back, that's not the way we play in the second half. We're going to have to get some things sorted out. We're going to have to address some issues because we let our guard down in the second half and nearly lost the dang game because of it. That was coach. Sure, there's a moment of happiness. There's a moment of celebration. But guess what? This is an opportunity to teach. And this is an opportunity to get better. And he was like that all the time. And that's why the program never leveled off. That's why the program never let their guard down. That's why the program continued to sustain excellence over the course of a 16-year period. Six national championships, nine national championship game appearances. 
handful of SEC championships, eight college football playoff appearances, just a remarkable run of consistency and success because the leader of that organization was the epitome of consistency and success. A couple of tweets that came in from former players that we felt like we wanted to uh, make sure that everybody heard, thought they were special. Here's Mark Ingram, Heisman Trophy winner. Coach Saban is the GOAT. Thanks for believing in me and a young man from Flint, Michigan. Helped him become a champion on the field, but more importantly, a champion in life. Enjoy retirement, Coach. You earned that. Love you, Coach Saban. Roll Tide. Dante Hightower, uh, another member of the 2009 team and a member of the 2011 team. Enjoy retirement, Nikki, my boy. Hell of a damn coaching career. Thanks for helping so many young men reach their goals and dreams. Hashtag RMFT. Mac Jones, a first round pick from just a couple years ago. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for teaching me the process. Thank you for the invaluable football and life lessons you taught me and so many others. Players, coaches, families, friends, and fans. Thank you to the greatest college coach of all time. Roll Tide forever, coach. Dre Kirkpatrick, one of the first big-time signees of Coach Saban's tenure there back in the late 2000s. Today is a weird day. I don't know how you how to feel, but I'm so happy I was able to play under you and learn so much from you that I still hear you saying it now. But congratulations on an amazing career, Coach. You're the definition of a leader and a true champion. You will forever be the GOAT. And a couple other coaches, in case you are exclusively living here in the college football world, a couple other coaches decided to shut it down in the NFL. One is Bill Belichick. The other is Pete Carroll. And Pete Carroll, of course, a long, Long history at USC, tremendous success at USC. Him and Coach Saban retiring on the same day is pretty remarkable. So a couple tweets from former assistants of both Pete Carroll and of Nick Saban. Here's Lane Kiffin. The two goats, so honored and blessed to have learned from them and won national championships with both. Thanks for taking a chance on me and being amazing mentors to me. Appreciate you both more than you will ever know. At Alabama football, at Seahawks, greatness we may never see again. Appreciate it, fans. And then Steve Sarkeesian, who, of course, left Alabama after the 2020 season to become the head coach of the Texas Longhorns. He, alongside Pete Carroll as well, where he coached early in his career. The two goats would not be where I am today without these two men as mentors. Thank you for everything. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. We gave it 24 hours. The 24-hour rule applies. Thanks to you, Coach Saban, of course. We got to just me kind of mellow and, and kind of skedaddle our way through the last 24 hours and try to just focus on what was accomplished and, and what was achieved. But at some point, we do have to flip the page and we have to focus on what's coming. And right now, uh, at the moment, it is one of the most highly coveted jobs in all of football, not just the NFL. This includes college, NFL, you name it. The head coach at Alabama has been occupied by two of the all-time greats, uh, Nick Saban and Bear Bryant. I personally think they're number one and number two, respectively, all-time as college football head coaches. So the place is remarkably attractive. And while it's a difficult job because the expectations are high, it is also a job where you can win championships because of alignment and the resources and the passion that exists here in the great state of Alabama. I know a little bit about what I think this job will entail and what kind of candidate will be under consideration. Now, without going too deep in the weeds and getting into specifics, uh, I do get the sense that whoever gets this job is gonna be a guy that has great energy, a guy that has a, a track record of success. I do think whoever gets this job 
will be endorsed in some ways by Nick Saban as well. And I think that there are a bunch of different candidates that would be really, really solid. But it also needs to be mentioned that fit is very important. And we've seen tremendous coaches, tremendous coaches, guys that I have the utmost respect for fail because the fit just wasn't right. And a lot of the fit might be based on personality characteristics, uh, maybe an identity offensively or defensively. Uh, for instance, do I envision Alabama all of a sudden morphing to a Mike Leach air raid style of attack? No, I don't. I don't think that's the route that they would go. I would expect whoever's the next head coach of Alabama to implement principles offensively that resemble that of what's been successful there for the last 17 seasons. A multiple style of attack, a group that uses a lot of shifts and motions, a group that believes in player development, but at its core, it starts from the inside out. A group that really prioritizes the line of scrimmage group that prioritizes development at the quarterback position and a group that also acknowledges complementary football because that's what won there for the last 17 years. I would expect the next head coach to follow in some of the same principles. As far as the defense is concerned, it's going to be a group that inherits a wealth of talent, a lot of young talent, but a group that has traditionally played pattern match coverage, a lot of man coverage and coverages that are very easily translatable to the National Football League. That's what's won there in the past. That's what I think will win there in the future. Like I said, I know quite a bit about what's going on with this coaching search, but I'm not going at the moment to list a bunch of names. It doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do my sources any good, but I can tell you, I think whoever gets the job is going to be really, really, really well respected. And I know that there are candidates that have shown interest in the job that you wouldn't think would show interest in the job because they're at a place that is already remarkably successful. So we'll leave it at that. But like I said, I would expect this decision to be made sooner rather than later. And I would be highly surprised if we fast forward to Saturday and Alabama hasn't found their next head coach. Mmm, you smell that? That's the scent of fresh turf and freshly cracked Dr. Pepper which can only mean one thing, it's college football season. So block off your Saturdays and swipe a sweet Dr. Pepper from the mini fridge because there's a new season of high kicks, long throws, and Fansville commercial breaks to carry you all the way to the West Coast games. That's right, the fans are back and this year things are heating up. We're talking about hot takes, more heartbreak, more layers of face paint, Get ready to drink in all the drama this season with the help of the most delicious college football tradition there is, Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. It's so great to hear from all these former players, what their interactions were like, their tributes to Coach Saban as he has now stepped away from the program in retirement. We wish him a happy retirement. He's earned it. <laughs> My goodness, has he earned it. So we are excited for him to see what he will pursue next because whatever it is will likely be filled with greatness if his track record is any indicator. That's for sure. Keep it locked in here too. The carousel continues to spin. The second Alabama has a head coach, we will be here. The second there is potentially other moves that could go down, we will be here. So keep it locked in to Always College Football on the ESPN YouTube show. You can also follow the show on social media at Always CFB on both Instagram and on Twitter. And then, of course, you can download and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. If you could, like, rate, and subscribe on there as well. That would be terrific. So for all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcast.